remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Travis Cook, back with you once again. And, you know, by now, most of you guys who follow my show, you know by now that I'm not one of these guys who's uh, going to come out here and tell you something that some focus group somewhere thinks you want to hear. I'm not the kind of guy that's going to have a bunch of market researchers tell me, oh, your audience will want to hear this, so do, do that topic and take this position. I've never been that guy. I've never been afraid of taking on a, a couple of sacred cows in American politics and saying, what needs to be said, regardless of what someone thinks about it, regardless of how well it might be received or how poorly it might be received. I don't mind saying what needs to be said when it needs to be said, and damn the consequences, damn the torpedoes. Well, today's going to be one of those shows. So buckle up the chin strap. Uh, this one could be a rocky ride. You know, at election time, we in the United States of America are constantly told that we need to consider the poor when it comes to whom we're voting for and why. Or when it comes to legislation, when it comes to what type of programs we're behind or what type of programs we want to cut or what kind of budget cuts we want to make or spending cuts of government, we're always told, we're always advised that we need to consider the impact on the poor as the most key consideration for whatever is being debated. It goes on all the time. You can listen to practically any speech of any Democratic candidate or sitting president and you'll hear that. You'll, you'll hear when, when Republicans want to cut something, you'll hear some Democrat come out and make it sound as though poor people will starve or grandma will be thrown off a cliff or whatever. It's a tried and true strategy on behalf of the American left. But in 2013, do we truly need a government to help the poor above and beyond everything else? Do we truly need a government that believes helping the poor is their top priority? Well, as I look at it, the facts that are out there would say no. Consider the following things. All of these are courtesy of the Heritage Foundation, by the way. You can look them, look them up yourselves. 80% of the households in the United States that would be considered in poverty or considered poor, 80% of those households have air conditioning. Now, back in 1970, only 36% of all of the United States population had air conditioning. Heck, I grew up without air conditioning. Two of the three schools that I went to growing up did not have air conditioning. But today, 80% of our poor households have air conditioning. 92% of poor households have a microwave oven. Nearly three quarters of all poor households have a car or a truck, and 31% have more than one vehicle. Nearly two thirds of poor households have cable or satellite television. Two thirds of poor households have a DVD player. 70% have a VCR. More than half of poor households have a personal computer. One in seven have more than one computer. More than half of poor families with children have a video game system of some kind, an Xbox, PlayStation, that sort of deal. 43% of poor households have internet access. One third of poor households have a widescreen TV or an LCD TV. One fourth of poor households have a digital video recorder system, a TiVo, that kind of thing. More than half of poor households have a cell phone. Now, I am not begrudging the American poor having any of those conveniences. And make no mistake, every, every item I gave you on that list is a convenience. None of those things are uh, requirements for living. None of those things are basic needs. They are all conveniences. And I would not begrudge any of America's poor from having any or all of those things that they might be able to afford. But given those numbers, I think it's pretty clear that the poor, so so-called poor in this country, really are not that bad off. The lifestyle of America's poor today would be the envy of the middle class most anywhere else in the world right now. And certainly it would be the envy of the poor anywhere else in the world. Likewise, even the richest, most wealthiest American 100 years ago would be stunned at the conveniences that the poor of today have that he did not. Now, don't get me wrong, there is no doubt that there are here and there individual people who are truly suffering. I do not deny that. And that will happen in any society, even in the best of circumstances. But it is clear that in the vast majority of cases, America's so-called poor are not suffering whatsoever. 
Simply put, there is not a large group of truly impoverished Americans who have the need to form a voting bloc so that government can fill their needs. Quite frankly, their needs are already being met and more so. Now, the people who we consider poor in America may not have as much as they want, but then again, whom among us truly does? And true, they might be a little bit jealous of what others have, and then there again, whom among us isn't to some degree? But they clearly have enough resources to take care of their own basic needs. They must have, if all of them can have air conditioning and cell phones and the like. Now, whether all of America's poor actually use those resources wisely to take care of their needs, that's probably another question. But there's no question. The resources are there and they have access to them. And yet, as a nation, we continue to allow ourselves to be held hostage by this so-called poor. Enough is enough. It is time that we started considering ourselves and our families first and foremost when it comes to question of politics, not the so-called poor that we're supposed to stop and sacrifice so that they can have a little more. We should not be swayed by the supposed suffering and impoverishment of a class that in a very real sense is not suffering, is not truly impoverished, and in terms of true poverty, doesn't even really exist to a meaningful degree. Now, to the degree that there is a need for actual help for those very few individuals who are truly impoverished or whom truly do need help, this can and historically has been handled by churches, faith-based organizations, a philanthropic community. In fact, most churches and, and other like-minded organizations are chomping at the bit to help in these areas. The argument that you'll always get from the left is if you cut a government program or you take out some government help, that that will leave a void that will not be filled. But that's not true. Faith-based organizations, churches, philanthropies, charities can, will, and have in the past always filled that void. There will be no void to fill. Americans, particularly conservatives, if I might say so, are so generous that there's simply no need to force others to make charitable donations by way of tax, which really is thievery. And that's not even taking into account the question of whether tax dollars end up actually doing positive charitable things. The facts would tell you they don't, but that's probably another discussion for another time. So the next time that a politician or some advocate for the so-called poor advises you that we need to tax the wealthy at a higher percentage so that the poor can have the basic needs of life, which they already have, or so that the poor can have more of an education or health care or birth control or any number of the other things that these advocates and do-gooders want those of us who are producers to foot the bill for, stand up and say, screw the poor! They've been living the high life off the backs of us producers for far too long. And if the so-called poor don't like it, then they can go to any number of other nations in, in this world. They're free to go. And when they do that, let's see how much better off their impoverished lives are over there. They'll realize pretty quickly that even if you're poor, you'll never have it so good as what you have it in America. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time.